sport related MRI and ultrasound in sport related muscle injury. My name is Francisca Sili and I'm the radiology manager at Columbia Asia Hospital Daling Jaya and I'll be serving you as your moderator for today. Okay, without further ado, now we're moving along to our session. Let's go straight to our first presenter. Please welcome uh, Ms. Lina Ko Shanwe, our speaker, our very first speaker for today, who will be speaking to us on role of ultrasound in assessing sport related. Uh, a very brief introduction of Ms. Lina Ko. She received her in undergraduate degree in medical imaging from University of Malaya and her postgraduate education is uh, from Visions College, majoring in medical ultrasonography. She actively participated in numerous ultrasound workshops in Asian Australasian region over the past five years and she is currently working as a sonographer at Bukit Tinggi Medical Center. Please welcome Ms. Lina Ko with her topic, Role of Ultrasound in Assessing Sport-Related Injury. Welcome, Ms. Lina. Thank you for your kind introduction. So let me share my screen. Uh, post disabled screen sharing. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for everyone for taking your time to, uh, to attend this CME session for today. And I would like to also thank the organizing committee for inviting me to share my experience in this session. So today, this is my topic, the role of ultrasound in assessing sports related injury. So I'm Nina, sonographer who is currently working in Bukit Tinggi Medical Center, part of a Ramsey Samdavi Group healthcare system. So this is the outline for my presentation for today. Firstly, I will, in, I will introduce some of the ultrasound features that are commonly being used in scanning sports related injury. And also I will share a few case studies, cases that I have done related to sports injury targeting the muscles, the tendon, and the ligament. And I will also talk about a bit of limitation of ultrasound in assessing these studies, and finally conclude my presentation for today. As we know, ultrasound is the use of high-frequency sound wave ranging from 5 to 50 megahertz to evaluate superficial structures such as the muscle, the tendon, ligament, or bursa. So these are a few ultrasound features that most uh, commonly used in this uh, during the studies. The first one is BMO ultrasound, which is which is what we usually see in radiology department, the black and white two degree scale images. Secondly, is color and power Doppler studies. This is used to demonstrate blood flow in the region of interest. So color Doppler. Is able, is able to give us directional information of the blood flow, but power Doppler does not give any directional information, but power Doppler is much more sensitive in detecting blood flow. So in MSK ultrasound, we usually prefer to use power Doppler because we just want to know whether the region of interest, if there is any blood flow or no. The direction of the blood flow is not very, uh, is a, is not very uh, informative for uh, it's not very important for us. So lastly is panoramic view of the ultrasound features. It's able enable us to demonstrate the whole structure of the region of interest and their relationship with the adjacent structures. So, however, there's also a few ultrasound features that are in market now, for example, elastography. Uh, but in my center, we didn't we don't use that that features for now. So these are a few uh, examples of pictures, the beam pictures of one of the rotator calf tendon or uh, shoulder. So view of the bicepital tendon and longitudinal view of the bicepital tendon. Just we can see different shade of black and white structures and 
then this is the color doctor mode of the muscle where, where we can see there's red and blue color. So show that different directions of the blood flow. And lastly, this is the panoramic view of, an, of the Achilles tendon, where we can see the distal side of the tendon until the whole length of the tendon until it's insertion into the insertion site. So, okay, for my presentation, all the pictures that I showed with, I share with you today is taken with this system, which I'm currently using a GE Logic S8 system. So these are the two props that I usually use. The nine linear prop is usually used for if I'm scanning uh, big, big structures or no, no, big patient, which is like obese. Uh, this, uh, the nine linear provide better penetration to see deeper structure. If I scan, I'm scanning like superficial structures. Uh, I will use the six to 15 uh, hertz, megahertz prop. However, in some centers, they have this hockey stick prop, which is being used to scan those very superficial structures because the footprint is very small. So it's enable us to scan these all small, small structures more clearly. So firstly, I will talk about the application of ultrasound in assessing muscle-related injury. So when scanning, we look for any changes of echogenicity and integrity of the muscle fiber. Is there any loss of the normal pattern pattern of the muscle fiber? If there is abnormalities in the pattern, we have to check for any if there is partial muscle tear or full thickness muscle tear. And also scan all the region of interest to look for any presence of hematoma. And for me, the most useful site for detecting abnormalities is compare the affected site with the contralateral site, the unaffected site whether there's any differences in the ultrasound appearance. So this picture, which uh, this is the normal appearance of ultrasound, or uh, uh, normal appearance of muscle in ultrasound. Okay, this is at the region of medial calf. We can see this region is the normal subcutaneous layer tissue and deeper structure. This is the medial gastroc muscles. You can see the pattern is uniform and homogeneous. And separating the gastric muscles with the soleus muscles is an echogenic fascia. There's no discontinuity with this echogenic fascia. And deeper structure soleus muscle and deeper calf muscle also nicely seen here. There's no an ultrasound if there is like collection of hematoma. Hematoma is usually liquid in nature, right? So liquid in ultrasound, it usually appears as a darker structure or black color structures. So there are a few cases that I would like to share with you. Okay. For case number one, there's a gentleman in his 30s came to um, our emergency department complaining of swollen right leg and pain at that region. So his initial lab work shows slight elevation of the dimer reading. So the MO doctor requested for ultrasound Doppler uh, to rule out DVT, depend from thrombosis. So I carried on my studies to check for any evidence of DVT by starting with common femoral veins. With compression, the veins is compressible. So there's no, no debris inside the veins. Then checking all through down the from the proximal to distal type and go to polyteal band, check whether the vein, polyteal band is compressible. So when I do the scan on patient, I usually talk to the patient and try to collect more histories from him from them. So for this patient, he also did mention that he went for long distance cycling tours a few days back and his symptoms developed and worsened after that. So I asked him to show me where is the region where he had the most pain. And this is what I see from ultrasound. At his calf medial region, at the distal part of the gastric muscles, you see this muscle, there's a bit of uh, discontinuity at the, the mass fibers looks not homogeneous and there's a bit of free free uh, surrounding the muscles. And when I own the color Doppler, there's no Doppler form, means that these black color structures is not blood vessels. 
is a bit of fit surrounding in between the gastroc muscles and the soleus muscle. So comparing the left medial calf and the right medial calf, you can see the difference. Uh, there is a bit of fit between the gastroc and soleus muscles. So with this, my radiologist suggested that maybe the patient has a uh, mild tear of his distal gastroc muscles, distal medial gastroc muscles. And further, uh, she suggested to do an MI on the patient to further assess the muscles injury. So for case number two, here's a lady in her late 20s came in for ultrasound of her forearm. She complained of pain and swelling at her right proximal forearm anterior aspect where I can remember is around the radial, radial head region after a badminton session. So her orthopedic surgeon requested an ultrasound forearm to rule out any muscle tear or hematoma. So this is what I see, the azure the view of the region of interest. Uh, this is the radial head, the longitudinal view, the radial head this is the muscle, which is, which, this is the area where she complained pain. So this is the muscle that I see at that region. This is, I think it's a brachial radialis muscle. So when I compare the right forearm, the affected side with the unaffected side, the left side, you can see there's a significant difference between the two, the, the muscles. The left muscles, you can see uh, is homogeneous. When comparing to the right, there is uh, areas with brighter structure, more echogenic, and areas with darker structure, more hypochoic. And this one, we said uh, the muscle looks a bit heterogeneous, a bit. And the size of the muscle is also looks as a difference in the size of the muscle. So I measured the AP, AP thickness of the muscle. There's a bit difference between the both sides. And lastly, uh, on the color Doppler, to check for any increase of vascularity, there's a slight increase of vascularity seen in the muscle. So with this, my radiologist concluded that my, the patient might have sprained her right brachial radialis muscle. So for case number three, uh, here is a 30-year-old man complaining of pain at both his thigh after a hard fall during cycling. So uh, the initial x-rays that I did on him show there's no evidence of fractures. But due to the pain and due to the pain, he was admitted to the hospital. After two, one or two days, he still complained of pain and swelling is getting worse. That's why his doctor requested for an ultrasound for both his thigh to look for evidence of hematoma. So this is what I see. Right at his right thigh, proximal to mid anterior lateral aspect, is the subcutaneous layer. Subcutaneous layer is the muscle. So this hypochondrial area between the subcut air tissue and the muscle, this is a collection here, likely a hematoma here. So further panoramic view of the tide is being taken to see the extent of the collection and really see the, diff, uh, the separation between, the collection is between the subcutaneous layer and the muscle. It's not within the muscle. So the axial view of the region of interest from the mid, uh, proximal tide to the mid tide region. And you can also see the Subcutaneous layer tissue here is a bit echogenic, uh, most probably due to correlates with the recent trauma that he had. Okay, for his light left thigh, uh, echogenic structure, echogenic uh, appearance at the subcutaneous layer here correspond to his recent trauma, but in between, there's no hypocrite area at the region of interest, means there's no, uh, no hematoma developed here. So the, the distal part, the subcut tissue is much more hypoechoic, hypoechoic, much more darker. This is the normal appearance of our tissue, our, of our subcutaneous tissue. This one is due to the contusion that he had recently. So in conclusion, my doctor reported that uh, this patient likely to have a hematoma at his right side to mid anterior lateral region. So this case is quite interesting because the hematoma is not within the muscle, 
is between the subcutaneous layer and the muscle. So I did a literature review and I found this case reported published in a paper. The, the author, Rainey, they published that, uh, they mentioned that a man with post-traumatic leg swelling and this, uh, what they published here is quite similar to the case that I, uh, I show you just now. They mentioned that uh, in their ultrasound also, there's a hypo hypocrite area between the subcutaneous layer and the muscle. So they mentioned that this usually happens after a blunt force trauma, and they call this lesion as Morial Lavalle lesion or Morial Lavalle hematoma. So they, for their patient, they did a CT scan to further confirm the study. You can see the subcutaneous layer and the muscle, there's a hypodense area here. So next, we go to the application of ultrasound in assessing tendon injury. Tendon is a structure that connects muscle to the bones. And in scanning tendon, it's very important for us to minimize anistrophy artifacts. Because this artifact can always lead to misdiagnosis and cause us to think that the patient might have tear or tear at the tendon. So, how to minimize this anistrophic artifact? It can be done by, okay, for example, I want to scan my this flexor extensor tendon, my extensor tendon of my wrist. So this is my prop. So I can either you like this, like this, like this, like this, to see, uh, to make sure the ultrasound beam is uh, always perpendicular, always 90 degree to the region of interest to the tendon that I want to see, or angle left or right, to make sure the ultrasound beam is always 90 degree to the region, uh, to the tendon that I want to see. So in scanning tendon, we assess the echogenicity, the thickness, the continuity, the vascularity of the tendon, uh, check whether there's any tendon tear or tendinitis. There are a few cases. Okay, first one is uh, a man in his 60s came for X-rays and ultrasound for his right shoulders because he complained of shoulder pain. So for these cases like this, I'll usually do the X-rays for the patient first to make sure there's no uh, pathology, uh, no, there is no pathology at the bony structures first, then only proceed with the ultrasound of the shoulder. So this is what I see in his ultrasound shoulder. So start off with bicipital tendon. This is the axial view of the bicipital tendon. The tendon still within the bicipital growth of the humeral head. Then there is a bit of fluid surrounding the tendon. When I do a uh, longitudinal view of the tendon, you can see this tendon is uh, the fibular pattern of the tendon still preserved. There's no discontinuity noted in the tendon. However, there's a bit of fluid, uh, fluid surrounding at the anterior and posterior aspect of the tendon. So continue with subscapularis tendon, the right side. Uh, this one looks pretty normal. Uh, uh, echogenic, no discontinuity. And the supraspinatus tendon also looks okay. A bit of leaf fruit here, thin sleeve of fruit here surrounding the supraspinatus tendon is considered normal, acceptable. So we conclude that uh, maybe this patient have a bit of bicep tendinitis. So for case number two, there's a gentleman complaining of pain and swelling at his right ankle. And he claimed that he twisted his ankle <clears throat> and heard a stepping sound when he was playing tennis. And the pain developed shortly after that. So his orthopedic surgeon requested an ultrasound to rule out an um, Achilles tendon rupture. So this is what I see, the panoramic view of his Achilles tendon. <clears throat> you can see there's a, bit, uh, there's a discontinuity at the Achilles tendon here. And to further, the, uh, to further document these pictures, 
the distance of discontinuity is being measured and also the distance between the continuity until the insertion site of the tendon is measured. Uh, however, for this, uh, then I scan the uh, medial and lateral aspect of the anchor that shows edematous tissues at the both at the ankle surrounding the ankle. So this patient is further suggested to do an MRI to further evaluate the Achilles tendon injury and also to assess all his other ligaments around the ankle joint so that proper treatment can be planned out for him. So lastly, we go to the application of ultrasound in assessing ligament injury. Ligament is a structure that connects bones to bones and ultrasound can be used to assess the, the ligament integrity and joint stability. As of my experience, scanning ligament is the most challenging part because uh, your, our anatomy knowledge must be very well equipped in order to know in order for us to know what we are looking at when we are doing the scan. And while scanning ligament, proper body positioning during scanning uh, is needed sometimes to stretch the ligament so that it provides better scanning window. For example, in ankle, to scan like calcaneal fibular ligament, calcaneal fibular ligam ligament, maybe you can dorsiflex and turn the, turn the, the ankle a bit to further stretch the ligament and provide a better view for the of the ligament. So this is the last test that I want to share with you. Here is a 70-year-old lady complaining of left knee pain and weakness after, after a fall when she exercised a week ago. Her orthopedic surgeon ordered an X-ray and ultrasound of the knee for initial evaluation. So as usual, do the X-ray first to check for any evidence of fractures or crack, then proceed with ultrasound. So I start with cardiac tendon. This is the patella of the patient. You can see the cardiac tendon extends superiorly. A bit of fluid surrounding the tendon is normal. This is the axial view of the tendon. So next we go to patella ligament between which uh, connect the patella with the tibia tibia prata. You can see there is no discontinuity around the ten, uh, at, the, at the ligament. A bit of fluid surrounding it is normal. So move to the medial aspect of the left knee. You can see the medial collateral ligaments quite clearly here and the medial meniscus from here looks quite grossly normal. Then go to lateral aspect the lateral collateral ligaments and medial lateral meniscus. However, all, um, then I moved to her palatial fossa. This is what I see, a cystic lesion with a neck here. So usually with this picture, we can think of Baker cyst. So measure the Baker cyst in three dimensions. And you can see the Baker cyst here, there's a bit of echogenic debris within it. So the I think the orthopedic surgeon for the uh, suggested the patient to further evaluate with MRI so that they can have a more clearer image. From ultrasound also, uh, we have, we from this study, we cannot see her anterior or posterior cruciate ligament clearly because it's, with, it's in between the bones. So uh, MRI is suggested to further evaluate this, that structures also. So here are a few limitations of ultrasound. Ultrasound hardly, as I mentioned earlier, hardly penetrates bones, cortex, bony cortex. They can cannot be used to visualize intraarticular injury, for example, the posterior and anterior cruciate ligament. Okay, MI still remains the gold, gold standard to diagnose such an injury. And ultrasound is highly operator dependent and to do an a good ultrasound, a detailed knowledge of muscular skeletal system is necessary so that diagnostic value, uh, images of diagnostic value can be provided, can be obtained during the scan. So in conclusion, ultrasound do play an important role in assessing sports related injury uh, because it is widely available, cheap, fast procedure, and most importantly, tolerable by most of the patient. And it uses non-ionizing radiation and suitable for a pregnant lady also. 
And at the, um, at the meantime, ultrasound also able to give dynamic evaluation on the muscle, tendon, and etc. So these are my references. And with that, thank you for your attention. Okay, Miss Lina, thank you. All right. Uh, oh, stop thank you, yeah. <laughs> Again? Oh, to shop. Stop. Oh, stop. Uh, stop. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's okay, no problem. Uh, thank you, Miss Lina, uh, for addressing the topic. Uh, I can see there is a question also, even before I open the slot for the QA sessions. But anyway, thank you for addressing the topic. Uh, now, uh, we can open the slot for the Q&A sessions uh, and forward your questions over here, either in the chat room or uh, you can open up your mic to ask Ms. Lina. But at the current moment, we do have one question uh, by Ms. Nohafiza. Uh, the question is, what is your challenge in work as a ultrasound radiographer? Can you please share with, uh, with us? That's what is, uh, she's been asking. Ultrasound means covering ultrasound and radiographer job. Yes. Uh, means you have to like an octopus. Be like an octopus, cover here and there. <laughs> I see. Uh, so far, how? And the interesting part doing this is we, you can correlate with their x rays and CT with your ultrasound. So when usually patient will come for ultrasound first before CT. So when you found something in ultrasound, you are excited to know whether what you found is correct or not, right? So when next time when the patient comes for CT scan, you sit there and see whether it's what you found, what I find in the ultrasound is correct or not. This is like a like pure self-satisfaction. Okay, that's a good one. Uh... Anything else that you wanted to share with us? You know, being an ultrasonographer and radiographer at the same time. Mm. I'm sure it is a pretty much uh, an exciting journey for you being bought at one time, I guess. But my main job probably is ultrasound. So if, if for me, I don't like to sit, sit still. So if there's no ultrasound, I will busy body X-rays. <laughs> Okay, that's a good one. So I guess, uh, any more questions, anyone? Uh, how many of you guys are actually ultrasonographer joining in over here for today? Can anyone type down in the chat room as well? If you guys malu-malu, uh, now open the mic. All the radiographers, I guess. Okay. I see. Uh, way before that we end up our first sessions. Uh, okay, I do have a question. Oh, two ultrasonographers. Okay. All right. Uh, let's hear from the ultrasonographer in the in the ground uh, from the floor. So any questions, guys? Can type down in the chat room. Uh, we still have some time for the Q&A sessions and anyway. Well, but way before that we answer their questions, I would like to, you know, not to ask, but then I would like to know as well, uh, what is actually the most uh, higher advantages of ultrasounds as compared to MRI? As you know, the MRI is actually still a gold standard for the, you know, injury. Uh, especially for the extremities injury, uh, what is actually the advantages of uh, ultrasounds? I, I would love to know that actually. Okay, for ultrasound, because it is very fast procedure and tolerable by most of the patients. So when, when the queue of MRI to do an MRI is very long, so usually the doctor will request for an ultrasound to have a general look at the structures first. 
So if the diagnosis can be achieved, that, that way maybe doctor can start planning the treatment, give, uh, give some mild treatment first for the patient to relieve their pain while waiting for the MRI to be, be done. Okay, okay. Uh, but uh, still, don't you think that we can go straight away to MRI? I mean, straight away go to do MRI? Yes, if there's no queue, you can straight away go in the, the MRI room. But usually in uh, big centers or in hospital, MRI queue is quite Yes, quite, it's quite, quite long. long. Yeah, mm. correct, correct. So, so most so. of the time for the Achilles tendon rupture uh, that I presented just now, Mm -hmm. So obviously the patient might have Achilles tendon injury already, but maybe sometimes for insurance purposes, they want the, like initial diagnosis first for further clearance of the insurance. They will do an ultrasound first. Yep, that will be good. Okay. And uh, one more thing. I can see from the initials um, case study, I guess if I'm not mistaken, is uh the one with the reference, the muscle, uh, the area, the regions of interest is actually muscle case number three. Can you go back to the slide? Uh, yes, this is the one. Okay, can you go to slide number 11? Okay, this is pretty much uh, a CT scan on the right side, right? Yes. Okay, why not MRI? Oh, this is a case reported from published outside. I see. Uh. I mean, from... From the point of view of this kind of uh, your case study, why not do MRI no, uh, instead of ultrasound? Maybe it's the fast, <laughs> the fastest uh, way to get uh, the fastest, initial yeah. diagnosis, is it? Yes, I think so. I see. So, okay. But MRI okay. do can give a better appearance. Yes, yes. Differentiation Especially between. Uh, Correct. Um, but again, the, it seems to be quite obvious on the ultrasound images itself. Can we see the slide number 10? Mm. This is the one, right? Uh, so this ultrasound, actually for this patient, uh, my yeah. doctor, my my orthopedic surgeon never ordered an CT or MR for him. I see. Uh, so he I think last uh, this week he came in again complaining both. This was, I think, end of July. So, yes, this week, he came in again complaining the same. Uh, I repeat the ultrasound again. This still looks grossly the same. I think doctor further treated him to an expiration and with bandages so that the collection won't accumulate again in the future. But it's quite an interesting case for this one, actually. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And also the, you know, the lady with the case study with the lady playing badminton just now also a very good case as well. This one is really real life scenario in my hospital. <laughs> See, yeah, it looks like a real case study at your place, isn't it? Mm -mm. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, anybody else want to ask? Okay, we're still waiting uh, questions from our ultrasonographers. Is there is anything else that you guys want to ask us before we move to our second speakers? Anyone? One question for me. All right. Lina. Yes. Good morning, Lina. Okay. Uh, wow. Uh, I just want to ask uh, why you choose to be a sonographer? Instead of being a diagnostic radiographer, we can focus on MRI, CT, and why you choose ultrasound? Why I choose ultrasound? To be honest, it's better pay. <laughs> but I still choose to do radiography work. 
So I can do both at the same time. Yeah, that, that may, there must be a, something that uh, interesting in ultrasound or your 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 desire to to. Uh, okay, because ultrasound, I for me I can know what I'm looking at. I have to find the problem. It's not like I'm the radiologist. Like I'm not. I, I I understand what I'm scanning. So when I study X-rays, okay, I know this the X-rays of the hand. But I the the the, the very obvious pathology, okay, we can identify, but like small, small pathology cannot really identify. So when I get posting in ultrasound, it's quite interesting to see what the sonographers find during the studies. So that made me want to study ultrasound also. And by the way, my lecturer also encouraged me to go for ultrasound. So I took up one year course, but the course is very expensive. I, but I think it's worth it. Thank you. Okay, anybody else on the floor? Okay. Uh, all right, I guess that's just about it for our first uh, presenter, first stations of the day. Now, I guess I don't want to one master. Let's go to the our next sessions. Our next session is actually with uh, our second presenter of the day, Ms. Noor Amira Binti Mahadi. Uh, she will be speaking of wet bearing MRI of the knee, the advantages and limitations. Now, before we present, uh, before the presentations begin, allow me to introduce our second speaker, Ms. Noor Amira. She is graduated from University Technology Mara, UITM, with bachelor's degree in medical imaging. And now she is serving at Alti Orthopedic Hospital as an assistant radiology manager. With an experience over a decade, uh, Ms. Noor Amira is focused on MRI when she served Pantai Hospital. Uh, Kuala Lumpur back then. Uh, with the experience she has, I am welcome Ms. No Amira to present her topic of wet bearing, MRI of the knee, the advantages and limitations. Welcome Ms. No Amira. All right, thank you and good morning everyone. Okay, so uh, my name is No Amira Mdi Mahadi. So for today, I would like to present uh, regards to MRI wet bearing. Uh, just let me share my screen. Uh, screen is hold on. All right, is everything okay? Okay. All right. So uh, today's focus will be on the MRI of the knee. So this is what we call as MRI weight bearing. But before we start, I would just like to uh, introduce what MR weight bearing is. So MR weight bearing uh, stimulates, uh, simulates a standing up position by applying compression to the body. The imaging captures how the patient actually feels while standing and takes into account the effect that gravity has on a patient's anatomy. Okay, so previously, when a conventional MRI is uh, what we do while in supine position. I think uh, this is currently the new advances that we have in MRI. Because if I'm not mistaken, previously, if we do uh, what we call as weight bearing, so we wear a jacket that has a, a connected to uh, the heel of our foot and will give compression uh, roughly about half, if, if I'm not mistaken, the calculation will be half the weight of our the, the patient's body. So that's how we simulate uh, weight bearing do, uh, those days. Okay, so now we're actually doing it in uh, standing position with uh, gravity and also the patient's body. Okay, so uh, weight bearing MRI provides the highest quality imaging available and can influence physicians' treatment decisions. Most importantly, it gives uh, the patients more insight into the true nature of the patient's condition. Okay, so weight bearing MRI application. Mostly we will do weight bearing MRI uh, in joints such as knee, ankle and foot. Uh, and also hip. For the spine, it's more, morely, we will do it on cervical and lumbar because that is where when uh, we apply uh, weights, 
uh, the patient would be feeling most of the pain on these areas. So before we uh, I give before we talk about the MRI weight bearing, uh, we should know that MRI weight bearing is actually an open MRI concept. Okay, so I will uh, discuss about the advantages and drawbacks of the open MRI itself first. Yeah, for the advantages, uh, the imaging is in more physiologic conditions. Okay, so it's not um, what we call as the tutup. It's not confined. Okay, so it uh, decreased patient confinement. So patient with claustrophobic uh, problems will find it slightly okay with open MRI. Okay, and also uh, it's less clinical, clinically available. Possibility of fatigue or pain due to pathological, uh, pathologic conditions. So the drawbacks is uh, lower field strength because usually for the open MRI is a permanent magnet. Uh, in what we have now is actually 0.25 Tesla with the current conventional MRI will go up to three Tesla and also it will increase exam time and cost because of the uh, lower field strength, the imaging time will also increase. Yeah? So in a supine closed bore MRI, so first the advantage will be higher field strength. Okay, like I said, uh, the most that we have here in Malaysia will be three Tesla. And it will, the, the, the higher the Tesla of the MRI, it will decrease the exam time and also the cost, and it's more clinically available. And the drawbacks would be uh, the imaging is in less physiologic conditions. It's more confined and patient would be more claustrophobic. Uh, and also specialized hardware may be required for loading or stress. Like I said before, that uh, those days what we do for weight bearing is we wear a jacket that uh, then we apply compression from the feet itself. So then the MRI knee, when we talk about MRI knee, uh, it's a conventional knee MRI. It's normally performed in standard supine position under non-weight bearing conditions. This is uh, widely known, uh, what widely uh, accessible in Malaysia. And however, the evaluation of knee joint modifications under physiological weight bearing conditions is necessary to understand the natural motion behavior of the knee joint. Moreover, MRI with weight bearing may be useful for identifying conditions that are challenging to diagnose. By using standard MRI, such as cases in which patient manifests symptoms only in a certain position or only with weight bearing. Okay. Uh, the reason why we would want to do MRI weight bearing is first, okay, let's say sometimes patients uh, come in with pain, okay, uh, having pains on the knee, or probably, okay, uh, I will talk about the spine. Patient having pain on, the, on their lower back or pain on their neck area. But then when we do conventional MRI, uh, from the image itself, we see nothing wrong. Basically, everything is normal. And there's, if, even if there's uh, some pathological uh, problems, it might be not as severe as what the patient has uh, told us. So when then the report will say, okay, everything is normal, everything is okay. Uh, but then the patients keep coming in saying that, okay, you know what, this is not what as what your previous uh, report says, I'm still having pain and I'm still, whenever I'm standing up, whenever I'm walking, patient's still having pain. So uh, this is what, when we want to do MRI weight bearing, okay, because sometimes when we do MRI weight bearing, we can see uh, that there's a difference in uh, the pathological problem that, that we see previously in conventional MRI uh, as to weight bearing MRI. Okay, so for the MRI uh, knee of our weight bearing uh, examinations, first is to better understand uh, meniscal pathologies, the unstable lesion, enhanced meniscal protrusions, or detachment from capsular and its ligaments for clearer description of flap lesions. And the second one is patellar displacement, bulgar or various knee, better understanding of pathologies or atrocities in the femoral patellar compartment, sprain, partial or complete tear of ACL and PCL and also sprain partial complete tear of collateral ligaments. This is what, uh, this is what we can see in, to differentiate between uh, normal conventional MRI to the weight bearing MRI. I will show you the images and by far the advantages of the MRI weight bearing. So for this one uh, is the weight bearing instability posterior shift. As you can see on the left is in a supine position. 
And on the right here is the weight bearing uh, positioning. You can see that the, uh, the knee is actually interiorly displaced when we do weight bearing. Okay, when you apply weight, you can actually see the uh, normal, what we call as uh, normal when patients are actually standing up and having pain. As to those in supine position, you can see that is the anterior displacement. At the, sorry, the posterior displacement between this one. Eh? Okay, so and then next one. So uh, ligament laxity overload. Okay, so as you show on the left one is a supine position and the right is a weight bearing positioning, weight bearing MRI. So while doing in supine position, you cannot see very clearly, okay, the ligament on the, on the knee. Well, on the weight bearing positioning, you can see very clearly when we apply uh, weight, when we apply pressure, the ligament is uh, quite clear in this uh, images. You can see very clearly. Yeah? So, and then this is the uh, patella subluxation. Okay, for those patients sometimes that, are, that came in, like uh, they will say, <clears throat> While walking and while like running, they will feel like sometimes they're better lap, they don't punya, apa, uh, lutut lari. Okay, lutut lari, they will be like macam, macam tak stabil je lutut dia orang ni bila berjalan. Tapi when we do supine in supine position, uh, actually the patella looks fine. It doesn't like terkeluar ke daripada socket dia. It doesn't, it just, it looks very, very fine, very normal. When we apply pressure in weight bearing positioning, uh, you can see it's actually the patella is already the cloa. So this is uh, just to confirm that what the patient is experiencing and uh, to the image, to the MRI images, is, it's confirmed. Okay, patient is not making like hallucination lies or whatnot. That is actually happening to the patient. Okay. Uh, and next is uh, for the SCL rupture. Okay, for A and B is actually... Uh, uh, in supine position, so in C, the image is in a weight bearing position. So you can see uh, it's already clear there's a rupture here of the SCL. So if it's, but when we, uh, how can we actually confirm there's a uh, SCL rupture apart from this image, obviously, is that uh, you can see the uh, patella, uh, sorry, the, the, there's an anterior displacement, if you can see very clearly, it's actually uh, between this uh, this image and this image, okay, the tibial plateau is actually anterior, anteriorly displaced. You can see the actually the jarak is quite uh, quite big compared to this one. All right. So when you apply pressure, uh, um, since the SCL has ruptured, the is confirmed when the tibial plateau is actually anteriorly displaced. Yeah. Okay. So this is for meniscal tear. I'm just going to compare between the supine and also the weight bearing uh, image. So this is a sagittal image of uh, in supine position. This is coronal image in supine position. Well, these two with C and D is in weight bearing position. Okay, as you can see very clearly. Okay, uh, the the uh, meniscal tear here. You can it's already you can see it's already torn, but when you apply pressure as uh, you can see in the coronal positioning, it's actually uh, quite clear, very clear uh, that the uh, meniscal is tear. Uh, but then uh, because of the <clears throat> condition where patient is in supine, there's only a patient in weight bearing position, you can see it's clearly in different position. So it's consistent with unstable tear. All right, you can see very clearly in here, you cannot uh, determine whether or not it's uh, torn or not. This one is not very, it's not very clear, but when you put in pressure, you can see very clear that it is torn. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry if I talk too fast. Okay. So this is a patella subluxation. So this A and B is in supine position. This C and D is in weight bearing position. Okay, this is what we call as patient with high riding patella and patellofemoral instability. Okay, when in supine position, we can see that the, the um, patient is very, uh, the knee is very stable, the patella is in uh, correct positioning and everything is in, uh, it's, it look, it's looking normal. Okay, but when we apply pressure, it's very evident that um, what we call as uh, kita punya uh, junction here, 
is uh, decreased. Sorry, it's uh, it's decreased. So and also the patella here is uh, you can see that it's uh, suplex to the side. It's not in its uh, correct positioning already. So uh, it is not looking normal as to compare with uh, in supine positioning. All right. So this is when we confirm that patient is actually suffering uh, some sort of pathological problem. So uh, it's good to compare uh, between uh, supine and also in weight bearing. I think most of the surgeon now is uh, turning into this uh, weight bearing MRI because they would have an uh, concise answer as to what the problem that the patient might have. Okay. As for limitation, first, I, uh, it does not fully reflect the dynamic flexion kinematics of the lower limbs as the joint is evaluated under static upright and weight bearing conditions. Uh, uh, need to tell what we call as uh, because the patient is in standing and it's in upright position, but it's in static. As well as, as kita punya uh, knee is actually used for walking. So uh, does the, the movement when the patient is having problem during the movement itself, well, like walking or jumping or uh, running, you cannot actually differentiate between that static weight bearing and also uh, that, that kinematics weight bearing. So that's the limitation in that uh, in this uh, weight bearing. So and the second one is patient not in full vertical position or 90 degrees. Patient usually be inclined backwards to ensure comfortable stance during image acquisition. So it's questionable to what extent the body weight is supported by the backrest. Okay, uh, in order for me to explain what's uh, the limitation for this one, uh, I would like to, to explain how we do the MRI weight bearing. Okay, uh, even though the, uh, the weight, the patient is in standing position, but it's not fully 90 degrees. Because if we put patient in a 90 degree position, sometimes patient uh, feel macam nak terjatuh. But the body is not tegak, so patient is not comfortable. So uh, what we do is actually we slightly uh, draw back the inclusion, which means kita put into more over like 81 degrees instead of true 90 degrees. So that patient uh, a bit comfortable, uh, patient can put the weight mostly on their back. So this is the limitation because we don't put actually 90 degrees. We actually uh, turunkan patient sikit into 81 degrees. So to make the patient more comfortable because sometimes the patient in, is in so much pain, if we put into 90 degrees, they cannot withstand the imaging uh, procedure hours. Okay, so the third one, the joint is usually in bipedal stance, thus making it inadequate physiological knee loading in situation when the body is completely transferred onto one leg. Okay, maksudnya adalah uh, in MRI weight bearing that we are doing uh, now currently, uh, it's actually when patient is standing with both legs. It's not patient berdiri satu kaki saja. So, whereas uh, normally when kita berjalan, when we are walking or running or jumping, it's actually uh, uh, Patient weight is mostly loaded into one leg when you're walking. Okay, when you're walking one leg to the left and then to the right. And so the weight is transferred from the left to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. While the MRI weight bearing is actually, uh, patient is just standing and standing with both feet. So it's not actually as the normal kita buat berjalan lah where the, the patient punya weight is, is on one side. Okay. So the kita tak tahu as to what extent as the uh, problem, the pathological problem that patient having, sebabkan patient punya weight is being shared with, with both legs. Uh, okay. For the fourth one is long acquisition time and pain, making it not always possible to apply more than 25% of body weight through the foot. So this is, uh, kita tahu kalau kita, when we do open MRI, the time is actually longer. For example, yeah, here in RT when we do MRI weight bearing of the knee, it will take roughly about, uh, for most normal sequences, lah, normal MRI sequences, it will be roughly about one hour, one hour plus. However, kalau kita buat MRI weight bearing, we don't do all the sequences in weight bearing. 
What we do is, uh, sebabkan doktor nak compare between standing and supine position, we will do the weight bearing first, berdiri dulu, we will position in supine position, we will just position patient in supine position, bagi dia baring, kita centerkan the image and everything, and only then kita put patient in a, a standing position. But then the sequences, kita tak buat do all the sequences in MRI for the knee. We will only do roughly about two to three sequences. Mostly we will do PDFAT set and also um, 3D. And after that, we will put patient back in the supine position. We will do the rest. Uh, we will finish the normal sequences for the normal MRI of the knee so that the, do the doctors can compare. That's why most people like some like doctor surgeons also like very sometimes they clear very confused. Some when they ask for weight bearing images, uh, we will always tell them doctor we will only do two to three sequences in standing position because uh, we were advised not to put patient in standing position more than 15 minutes. Because sometimes when patient is in a lot of pain, they cannot always stand for more than 10 minutes, they will feel uncomfortable and also they will bergerak-bergerak and gain gambar pun tak berapa cantik lah. So that will lead to the fifth limitation, the patient discomfort, which eventually makes the patient movement, thus degrading the images in MRI. Okay, so uh, and then the next, I will talk slightly about our MRI. is a Saute G-Scan MRI with bearing. Okay, so in MRI, uh, in our South AG scan MRI weight bearing, we can do dynamic MRI. So what is dynamic MRI? Uh, it's the imaging of joints in real time. So while the joint is slowly moving and how is it done? Uh, sing, uh, very fast single slice acquisition techniques and the control can be moved either by the patients or the MRI tech or doctor. Okay, this selalu kita nak nampak CT dynamic. Now we will see MRI dynamic. Okay, so this is uh, roughly the contoh lah, the example. So this is what patient in static, which is patient in supine static or standing. So you cannot see exactly actually patellar instability or whatnot. So when we do dynamic examination. You can see very clearly actually the patella is displaced or subduxation occur. Can, can you see just now? This is the image for the 0 0.3 Tesla. Ours is 0 0.25 Tesla. Roughly about the same. Okay, we'll see one more time in the dynamic motion. Actually, kita boleh control the the how fast the image or the dynamic can uh, can be. So I think the this one they did it very fast. So you cannot see very clearly. But you can see here it's is displaced. The patella is displaced. All right. So for the G scan is uh, patient comfort and economic design. So no proscopic effects. It's uh, I mean it. This is for all the. Uh, open MRI, eh? open MRI, no patient claustrophobic can do it here. And so uh, easy positioning. You can see the coil, it's in, it's like a go to coil for the shoulder. If let's say for conventional MRI, it's very close. And also for the positioning of the shoulder, it's quite uh, difficult for the patient, sometimes patient, big patient or whatnot. Okay. This is what we have for the cervical coil, and this is for the uh, lumbar coil. We can do it for hip also. And then uh, what we do when we want to sculpt or localize is actually, okay, we cannot actually go into the room. What we do is, uh, while patient is positioning inside, we can see uh, what we call as live images here. We just uh, click a few of the buttons and we can see the live images and we can see whether or not the patient is in the correct positioning, whether it's centered or not, we can just always advise patient to okay, you can move uh, slightly in, move upwards a little bit while positioning patient inside the room itself. So we don't have to go in and out of the room. So the past sequences and uh, sequences and protocol, uh, basically about the same with the conventional MRI with a few upgrades. Okay, uh, we have a uh, fat suppression, uh, normal spin echo and gradient echo. This is uh, fat spin echo. This is normal as the conventional MRI. And then fat, uh, fat suppression, we, we do have stir 
we do have uh, export as well. And for 3D, uh, uh, we usually do 3D shark and we do have 3D highs as well. Uh, and the current one, we have metal artifact reduction and real-time dynamic study, just like I've shown just now. Okay, so this is uh, the 3D shark uh, that we are currently uh, using for the open MRI weight bearing. So you can see very clearly here the, all the uh, cartilage and all the problems is clearly shown, all the pathological problem is clearly shown in the image. We can see we can uh, differentiate uh, all the uh, anatomy in the patient itself. Okay. Also, uh, you can see how this is for the spine. We, we use 3D highs for the spine, while 3D shark we will do mostly for joints. Okay, so you can see very clearly this is normally used for spine. It's very high special resolution. Uh, you can see the nerve roots and spinal cord, it's, everything is well enhanced. Okay, uh, this is for the uh, advanced pulse sequences for the X bone. Uh, we use the uh, Dixon technique for water fat separation. We do have a uh, Dixon in conventional MRI as well. Okay, so uh, this is high sensitivity for post contrast amnestation uh, imaging. Okay, for one acquisition, I will provide four different contrasts and high sensitivity for meniscal lesion and cartilage. So, uh, it depends, T1 weighted or T2 weighted. So T1 weighted for post-contrast emission and T2 weighted for enhancing inflammation area and bone edema. So you can see very clearly here. So here. Okay, so this is uh, SPAT. This is SPAT, spin echo descent, uh, new fat saturation approach. Okay, uh, we are using SPAT in MRI weight bearing currently. Um, it's actually... Uh, while using SPAD, actually it will increase, uh, it will decrease our time acquisition because in one uh, sequences, we get multiple images, okay? So then the sequence acquire two echoes, one sipping echo and one, uh, and one GRE, and then applies the decent technique to get fat and water separate images providing for the uh, diagnostic capability. So we, we, all, we would use uh, SPAD mostly uh, in joints and also uh, small anatomy, just like hands, we will use pet mostly. Okay. This is another example of the uh, spat, it's compared. Yeah, the better muscle and bone and tendon visual visualization. So it will give us a sharper image as well compared to uh, the assets the, that we commonly use in conventional MRI. Okay, so this is a uh, low field MRI and MAR technique. So in the standard one, you can see here, uh, if patient have done some uh, operation before, the artifact is quite, uh, quite prominent. While in the normal, and we, we use the MAR, the artifact is uh, reduced slightly. Okay, as, uh, also our MRI, we have uh, this, what we call as MAR, metal artifact reduction. You can see, uh, if let's say in conventional MRI, if we see this uh, patient, when patient comes in and we do the uh, first imaging, uh, we already see that patient have done something and the artifact is quite bad. However, in our MRI weight bearing, the SLT one, uh, the artifact is actually reduced. Uh, okay. You can see this is the normal conventional uh, T2. This is the two. Okay. This is uh, actually the artifact is uh, reduced. Okay, sorry. So this is in spine operation. So if normal conventional MRI, if we see this, 
in patients on the first image already said, oh, you know what, uh, we cannot proceed because sometimes even the doctor said, uh, our radiologist will say, I cannot see anything because the artifact is quite severe. So we will ask patient can do in the open MRI, in bearing MRI, and you can see that the artifact is actually reduced. You can see the body of the, uh, the implant itself is quite clear, it's quite prominent, so it doesn't uh, affect the, uh, uh, the anatomy on the side itself. Huh? You can see, you can see, you can still um, differentiate. Right. This is another example for post-operative MRI imaging in weight bearing. So you can you can differentiate the artifact itself, and it's not that prominent. Okay, you can see the anatomy. You can see very clearly, even though there's a uh, artifact due to the operation that has been done before. Okay, you can see it's very nicely shown here. Okay. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Namira. Um, okay. okay. So I guess that uh, that's a finish of our second session's uh, presentations. Uh, it's a very interesting talk as well. Again, now we are open the next slot for a Q&A sessions. Uh, any one of you can open the microphone, forward your questions here, or even can type down your queries at the chat room. Uh, again, I can see there is one question being asked at the chat room. The question is, when you did MRI in standing, is it true that patients feel more comfortable and less fear? Uh, the participant asking because in lying positions uh, in MRI, patients easily get SOB. Okay, I think uh, the patient is getting SOB because one primarily is because patient is claustrophobic. Patient takut tempat sempit, so patient get SOB and they are dying to get out, out of the MRI uh, itself. Okay, have patient before masuk that jalan daripada tempat waiting area to the MRI itself, patient is like macam oh very talkative, very fine, very very good. Then once we put patient into the MRI room, they get agitated, baru suruh baring je, dia dah rasa tak selesa. Okay, so this is because I think uh, the reason why they get SOB is actually because of the claustrophobic. Okay, so when we ask the patient, okay, maybe you want to do it in open, okay, patient uh, masuk dekat uh, examination room in the open MRI, patient will say, okay, maybe we can't. they can do it. We will put, uh, first, they need to understand, we will put the patient in supine position. Kita akan baringkan dia, kita akan positionkan dia, and then we have to ensure that the patient, uh, uh, you can see outside, you can see you punya sekeliling, it's not like the confinement that you see in the normal conventional MRI. So it's open, you can see everyone, you can see the, the radiographer outside. So patient uh, can probably slightly rasa okay lah. But then uh, we will do in supine only, uh, we will do in standing positioning, in uh, erect position, only when the doctor asks us to. Only when uh, doctor kata, okay, I want to see the, the, uh, the difference uh, in in erect position and also in supine position, uh, only then we will do it in standing position. If let's say the patient is claustrophobic, we won't do it in, <laughs> in erect position uh, because it will only add more time to the patient and because kita, at first kita akan bagi to the patient, okay, kita boleh buat in open uh, MRI, but you need to know that open MRI takes longer time. Okay, it takes longer time, you feel more comfortable because it's open, but it will take longer time. Sometimes patient uh, punya perasaan pun sebabkan masa yang lama tu, sebab tu dia, dia rasa macam tak selesa. So, we need to bagi tahu patient, okay, in open MRI, it will take longer time. But in terms of doing it in erect position, uh, actually, we will only do it if the doctor asks us to do. 
if the doctor never or, or if the surgeon never asks us to do it in standing position, we will just do it in supine position. Because there's no use you ask patient to do in erect position, having the patients to tambah lagi masa in erect position, uh, lagi tambahkan dia punya macam apa, bukan nak kata ketakutan tapi dia punya anticipation of you you have to know that in standing position if let's say you ask the patient to do the whole sequence you won't want one patient to do it in standing position for one hour we only do it in 10 to 15 minutes only max we don't do it in one hour full sequence no see that's a good one that's a good sharing anyway and i got another question uh, this question is actually very interesting uh, i also intend to ask the <laughs> Just about the same questions as well. Uh, the second question is, Unidia, can you explain more about the dynamic scan MRI of the knee? Step by step, how you instruct the patients about the movement of the knee? Okay. Okay. So, they're not All right. Sure so, okay. So, uh, for the dynamic MRI of, uh, of the knee, eh, first, kita akan position patient uh, in mengiring. Kita tak, kita tak buat patient in normal superposition, kita buat decubitus, maknanya patient dalam keadaan mengiring according to which which leg yang dia sakit lah yang kita nak tengok, left or right. Okay, when we, we position patient in uh, dalam keadaan mengiring, uh, knee through the call, knee through the call, centered and everything, and then uh, the protocol, the sequences is already in the in the system itself. They just have to uh, push a, a few buttons. Okay, we will do it in 3D. Mostly we'll do it in 3D. So, apa yang kita buat is actually some, kita, nak suruh patient sendiri yang bergerak tu agak susah lah. So, one of the radiographer will be inside. Dia akan bagi instruction or sama ada dia bagi instruction ataupun dia pegang kaki patient. So, uh, the flow would be, okay, let's say, uh, Usually arahan yang saya bagi dekat staff dengan uh, patient is actually you you will hear it because MRI can very loud. Okay, whenever we do the images, you can hear the sound different. Let's see, kalau kita buat Quite T2, loud. dia punya uh, sound lain. Dia punya T1 sound lain, 3D sound dia lain. Okay, so when we do the the dynamic is actually uh, there will be count like uh, one, two, three. Uh, the the sound is different. So once the sound turns uh, different. You move slightly, and then you uh, then a few uh, um, seconds you stop, and then you will hear the sound again. You turn slightly. You have to do let's say kalau macam mana saya cakap okay let's say uh, this is your uh, knee dalam keadaan mengiring so kita buat macam ni ni so kaki tu kita akan pegang dia uh, kita pusingkan sikit then kita pusingkan sikit boleh nampak ke okay kita pusingkan sikit. Pusingkan sikit, pusingkan sikit, pusingkan sikit, pusingkan sikit sampai you get a full movement that what you want lah. Actually, masa dia dengan range pusingan tu, it's up to you. You can go however long that you want. Sama ada you nak go ke depan dan ke belakang balik. Tapi you have to do it slightly, 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 sikit, 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 sikit until you get the uh, motion that you want. Or you can stop ataupun you nak ke belakang balik, turn back and then ke depan balik, ke belakang balik, ke depan balik tapi whatever the motion is, you have to do it slide by slide by slide by slide sikit 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 sikit, sikit pusing, macam angsel tu sikit 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 pusing lepas tu kalau nak patah balik pun boleh it depends on what you want to see and how long you want it to to apa to happen it doesn't matter I see uh, I guess that how many degrees normally that you guys are turning the patient's punya knee joint tu uh, selalunya mostly we do like 45 degree lah 45 degree straight and then kita patah balik just, just to get a motion of the movement I see uh, uh, Okay uh, Nazri, Encik Muhammad Nazri is uh, Miss Noa Amira answering your questions Anything else that you wanted to ask? Tapi I'm quite uh, curious juga Is this uh, wet bearing the first one in Malaysia yang dekat Alti Orthopedic ni? Yes, we are the first uh, owner of the wet bearing MRI. I see. That's a good one. Uh, I never seen it, you know, alive before. So, uh, <laughs> is it is it huge? <laughs> is it huge? 
as the open MRI uh, yang no. biasa? Uh, macam open MRI yang biasa. I see. Uh, there's nothing extra extra about it. Just that it tilts lah. It can tilt uh, as the standing position lah. I yes, see. standing position, yes. It doesn't even require large space. I see. All right. Uh, and then the, how frequent? Uh, kalau uh, from your experience dekat LT, uh, bila you buat uh, standing, then later on, uh, untuk patient yang sama, you akan buat spine. How frequent is that? Actually, actually untuk MRI weight bearing, that is how we do it lah. Because, uh, uh, because you still need to compare. Sebab kita, kalau kita buat in standing position, for whatever reason, is knee ataupun uh, spine or whatever, kita still akan buat in standing and supine position because you have to know that in standing position, kita tak buat semua sequence. Kita akan buat two sequence max, 10 minutes max. Okay, so the doctor might not get all the information while in standing position. Kita buat standing position and then we will do in supine position full sequence, sama macam conventional MRIs, the doc, so that the doctor can compare. Usually, if let's say for spine lah, for spine we will do uh, T2 sagittal and also 3D sagittal. Okay, so we won't do axial, we won't do other sagittal. We will do only T2 sagittal and T3 sagittal and then we'll work in supine position, we will do all the normal sequences, all those three sagittal and two axials and maybe the 3D lah. So that the doctor can compare because sometimes uh, kita nak tengok ada beza ke tidak in standing and in supine position. Tapi kita tak boleh buat full sequence in standing sebab of course ambil masa yang lama untuk patient berdiri. So other than the difference, all the other, the rest of the information needed, for example in axial ke apa, we will do in supine position. Hmm. So uh, kebanyakannya uh, kita akan buat macam tu, unless kalau let's say uh, doktor kata, okay patient dah buat MRI normal supine position uh, dekat tempat lain. So I just want to know ada apa-apa beza tak in uh, standing position. Okay, kita akan buat standing position sahaja tapi itu pun still dua sequence sahaja. We won't ask the patient to stand for one hour to do standing position. Okay. Uh, Alright, that's understood enough. Uh, so, I guess the overall, the whole procedure of MRI knee for one side, uh, for both wet bearing and also for, uh, you know, supine will be roughly about one hour, one hour, 45 minutes to one hour like that. Betul tak? Correct. Uh, sekali yeah. dengan positioning, all the finishing, all the protocols and everything. It's quite the... Tolak, patient bergerak. Yelah, uh, provided the patient tak bergerak kan? Betul? Mm. Okay. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, anyway, uh, any more questions on the floor? We wanted to hear more questions that... Uh, and also Miss No Amira, I guess that she wanted to share her experience as well because kita semua I guess tak pernah ada uh, ni uh, wet bearing punya MRI so this is your chance to go and ask Miss Noor Amira so that she can share her experience anybody else on the floor okay I guess Tak ada. Uh, okay, before kita wrap up the sessions, I pun uh, nak bertanya, is there is any special case that uh, of MRI knee that you wanted to share with us, uh, you know, uh, lately in your, you know, throughout your working in uh, RT orthopedics, a, a good, nice case study that you wanted to share with us? <laughs> uh. Takat ni, I mean in RT because we only recently started for the orthopedic part So I think tak banyak case yang rare lah orang kata kan Cumanya uh, if let's say patient uh, having problems with joints uh, Doctor will either, because we have another machine also which is very new So sometimes doctor We'll do the MRI and and then we will do the um, uh, the what we call as the, the new machine, X-ray machine that we have lah. So that one is for the comparison. 
uh, uh, pre uh, operation and after operations uh, something like that because uh, kat sini in RT hospital we mostly do uh, let's say kalau operation pun uh, untuk patient yang having for TKR or UKR so here kita banyak buat sequences sequences or if, if, if extreme sequences yang kita Uh, imaging yang kita tak pernah buat kalau kat tempat lain macam I've been working in pantai for how many years? 9 years, 10 years then when, we, when I come here x-ray yang the doctor requested doctor ask uh, is nothing like what have been <laughs> uh, done before lah uh, so even MRI MRI is basically the same in every Uh, tempat pun kan semua tempat MRI dia punya protokol dia punya sequences uh, sama so uh, mostly yang pelik-pelik tu tak ada lah cuma pernah nampak uh, patient pasang macam saya kata pasang pasang susuk dekat kaki yang kita macam kenapa nak pasang susuk dekat kaki kan lalu kita nampak pasang susuk dekat muka so saya so, patient pasang susuk dekat kaki so nak ask patient uh, do you know If you have done anything, because when we do the MRI, the artifact is like very severe. So, apa yang dia pasang? It's not in the bone. It's not in the bone itself. Ah, it's not in the bone itself. There's much artifact. It's everywhere. But it's not in bone. So we ask patient. Patient said, "Ah, no, I haven't done anything. No operation, nothing." And then, tanya pernah pergi urut ke anywhere? Kita urut pernah, but I don't know what's what whatever yang orang tu buat lah. So when we do X-ray, it's Confirm I need them. Uh, need them, and then it's like you know, proceed with MRI. It's it's not ah uh, yeah, it's it's very severe. They punya artifact sampai kita orang tak boleh nak proceed dengan MRI. So patient pun macam uh, dia pun tak tahu apa yang dia buat. So kita tak tahu. <laughs> mm. Okay okay. Alright. Uh, we do have one more questions. Uh, it's actually from our MSR group. Uh, the MSR group been asking any specific indications for wet bearing MRI, or is it depends uh, on the doctor request? Uh, selalunya indication. The first thing indication is doctor just want to compare lah between uh, berdiri and also in uh, supine position. And also, we will see uh, the doctor request. Uh, usually, doctor akan request. Uh, okay, I want to do in wet bearing. Uh, so, when the doctor request in wet bearing, we know already kita akan buat uh, in standing position dua sequence and then still do bearing. Uh, unless patient doctor kata patient dah buat bearing dekat tempat lain. So, to see the special indication, not really lah. It's so mostly by doctor request. Okay, all right. Yeah. Anybody else on the floor before we wrap up the stations? Okay, all right. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Miss Namira. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, and thank you, everyone. You have heard uh, presentations from both of our speakers, Miss Lina Ko and also Miss. No, Amira, on this very timely subject, uh, we also have addressing some of the questions by uh, all of you. But uh, I guess, nevertheless, I also wanted to take a few minutes of your time, just a few more minutes, to hear the final remarks from our Malaysian Society of Radiographers, MSR Vice President, uh, Encik Muzakir. And uh, please welcome Encik Muzakir. Zakir. Okay. The floor is all for you. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum. <coughs> Very good morning. Uh, selamat pagi. Uh, thank okay. you, Francisca. Okay. <coughs> uh, firstly, saya nak uh, inform that actually this this session is for our president lah, Mr. Sawan. But unfortunately, there are something else to do. Uh, so he asked me to replace to give something like just short uh, closing remarks to all the participants okay uh, first of all uh, first of all uh, i would like to thank you uh, both participant uh, miss lina and amira for their times willing to accept our invitation 
to share their expertise, knowledge to our members among us. Actually, uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, we MSR, uh, what we do, we try to get, uh, we try to organize, get our members or among radiographer to share their knowledge, uh, their expertise, so that uh, we can update each other what is uh, currently happen in each center. Uh, for example, in Alti, they have a special web bearing MRI. Uh, first in Malaysia, it's good sharing for us to know what is the <coughs> how they operate the machine. Even though uh, kita tak dapat nak pergi sana kan, at least we get a uh, short idea lah how they do it. Maybe we can if uh, we we have a relative ke yang I think perlu that imaging so we kita ada channel. Oh, kita arti ada. Uh, so we can suggest. That's why important kita ada networking in MSR. <laughs> so we get the benefit. And then to others uh, participants, uh, thank you very much for your time during weekend. Uh, we try to do MSR, try to do what we can do. We, we gather all, we share knowledge, share experience so that we up, always update our knowledge uh, uh, so that kita akan progress kita punya education uh, continuously <coughs> even though uh, sebelum ni kita depend on uh, before the COVID punya situation kita depend on the course attend weekly ataupun monthly lah but after COVID kita dapat satu medium yang everybody dah dah common webinar kan online senang anytime kita boleh attend tak ada macam uh, very crucial nak kena transportation or anything kena pay for the recommendation. So webinar is a good medium that we can share knowledge among us. And I said, we MSR will use this medium um, majorly to to share knowledge among radiographer, either any specialty, uh, specialty lah, either ultrasound, MRI. We try to organize each month uh, CME lah, hopefully. Kalau tak dapat uh, join semua, uh, join yang you rasa you interested lah. <coughs> okay. And hopefully, uh, uh, I or and my ESCO and EJK in MSR, we, we try our best to get uh, something to all MSR member dan juga non-MSR member. Okay. We we as a uh, radiographer, diagnostic and therapy, actually we are like a family. So we try to get together uh, to share knowledge, uh, get advantage. Uh, and then in our focus, macam Cik Syawal cakap sebelum ni, we try to go for uh, focus on research among radiographer. Because uh, in clinical, uh, evidence-based uh, uh, practice. So with evidence, we can prove that uh, our profession is always up to date. So I hope uh, any radiographer in Malaysia that have interest, even you uh, fully ataupun uh, focus on clinical, sometimes you can do uh, just a simple research that sometimes we do, do uh, what we call uh, retrospective study. We collect data and we analyze and then we present. This is a, just a simple uh, research, but the sharing knowledge in clinical sometimes is very more valuable compared to the what we call the uh, special that new uh, investigation. <coughs> okay. Okay, I rasa I tak macam nak cakap lama. We, we can kan kalau cakap lama pun bosan. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, last but not least, uh, sekali lagi, thank you uh, our speaker. Uh, Miss Amira, first time saya, saya jumpa ni. Uh, Miss Lina, ini saya kenal. <laughs> UM student. And then Francis, for your time to be a speaker. And to all participants, uh, thank you very much for your time during weekend. Maybe we can meet uh, again in the next webinar. And maybe this year, uh, MSR akan ada dua dua lagi event yang bersemuka lah. Uh, for example, maybe we will uh, 
arrange for uh, World Radiographic Day celebration. And uh, our, our bowling activity to yang yang current lah. But Francisca, you will announce that. Right? Any others? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I can okay. announce. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, tidak dilupakan juga pada our uh, one of our school, Cik Zaimi Baharudin for for the opportunity giving dia punya staff to like, jadi speaker. Okay, uh, that's all for today. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Alright, thank you Cik Muzakir. Terima kasih banyak sebab <coughs> sudi bagi final speech, final remark for today. And uh, now before kita wrap up our session for today, ada announcement to make. Uh, this announcement is actually basically kita akan ada another sessions of CME next month, and the official announcement of this CME will be announced sometimes later. Uh, you just keep on browsing, you keep on scrolling our MSR website, and you will get the informations from there. Uh, and I guess by now, thank you everyone. Uh, for participating, sparing your time, your Saturday morning with us in this talk this time. Uh, I hope that I can see all of you guys uh, sooner next month. Lah. Uh, thank you everyone and have a pleasant weekend. Okay, thank you. Alright, thank you. Alright. Terima kasih semua. Okay. Oh, before, before we forget. Uh, before we forget, uh, anything we else? Take, take photo, photo. Oh, betul uh, juga. Boleh juga kan? Uh, uh, for the final one, let's take photo. Anyone yang willing to switch on the camera? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kita, apa nama? On the camera, anyone? Uh, oh, saya, saya ada nampak kawan saya lama, Siti Saniah tu. Lama saya tak jumpa dia. Uh, this kind of event that you will see, you know, a few names that familiar. Kat mana kerja sekarang Siti Sanya? Lemak, dia senyap lah. Ha, dia senyap. <laughs> Boleh ambil tak? <coughs> uh, kejap. I think Cik Siti Sanya boleh mute kot. Okay. Well,